Bulldog. It is mid 1960s on a sunny field in Massachusetts. There are nondescript flags posted at both ends of the field. It's a Boy Scout jamboree. And I and other Boy Scouts were scrambling across the field with one goal in mind, to either protect our flag or capture the enemy's flag. Why Bulldog? Well, you capture the enemy by grabbing onto them and yelling, Bulldog, one, two, three. If they don't break out from you by the time you say that, they're captured. And they mean no, try to get away. It was a lot of fun, but we had no idea really what this meant. We were just having a great time and hoping for some mores at the end of the day. We really had no sense of the true meaning to capture the flag. Likewise, the battle game Stratego, armchair generals would move pieces across a field, much like a piece of a game of chess. But again, there'd be no real understanding of the meaning behind. Uh, once again, it's captured the flag. And there'd be no real depth of understanding of what that was all about. It was just a board game. Even in terms of special ceremonies, sporting events, or parades, we see the national colors and we see the armed force service colors. But I doubt very many people in the pageantry of the event pay much attention to the individuals flanking the color bearers with a symbolic weapon. They probably just see this as part of the overall pageantry of the game or the parade, and they're not really focusing on the flanks. I hope to provide some further insight into that through the presentation. I also want to make a couple of quick comments. Uh, relative to the presentation, much of it is based on Union soldier recollections, but I want to stress that it could equally apply to Confederate soldiers. Secondly, this is not an apologia for the Confederacy. What they did was wrong, slavery, slavery was wrong, but you can't deny the courage of the soldiers on both sides of the conflict for what they did in support as much of their buddies as much as anything else. And that's a reflection during the presentation. Well, it's 1860, Lincoln's elected president and issues that were boiling, was already bleeding Kansas. A lot of things were already coming to a head. Lincoln's uh, ascendancy to become president was the final straw. Both sides of the, of the, the country is essentially pulling apart. Flags played a role in that growing divide. Baltimore, December 7th, 1860, an unknown writer to friend Bob. There is thousands here or, who are hot for disunion and they are secretly organizing into companies. So I hear cockades, you heard about yesterday, cockades would be like a lapel pin. Cockades are as plenty as June bugs in July and the palmetto flags wave from two establishments all the time and at night from several places. So you may judge something is in the wind though I do not know what it is. South Carolina seceded weeks later after this letter was written. And the Palmetto flag, the state flag, there was no Confederate flag, there was no Confederacy yet, but there were sympathizers in Baltimore using the state that was furthest towards secession, South Carolina, using that flag to express their support for the growing divide. Confederate flags of the Civil War, first pattern, stars and bars, there was a bit of a still a resemblance to the Union, the national flag, and that's what I'll get to in a moment. Um, but in battle, that flag represented too closely in battle in the confusion of battle, <laughs> the Union flag. So there was a designed battle flag using the cross of St. Andrew. Army of Northern Virginia adapted it. Other uh, units did a similar um, variation of that. To make it very clear, this is a Confederate flag. It's not to be confused with the Union flag in battle. Lower left, you've got, okay, how do you get this into? Um, we have to figure that out. So. Okay, all right. Lower left, in order to, again, avoid the confusion of the first national flag, you had the stainless banner, which was the battle flag and then a white field. Even that in battle might be confused with a surrender flag, just seeing the full white. So at the very end of the Civil War, the adoption of the third pattern, the bloodstained banner, and certainly by the spring of 1865, that was a very appropriate title for both North and South. Well, it's May 1861, several, a number of states have seceded. And what's happening in the country is you've got a great divide, but within those sections that are dividing, there's an intense desire to, to band together and reinforce identity. 
So in the north, you've got Boston, May 1st, 1861, the Old South Meeting House, rally around the flag, consecration. And during that ceremony, one of the speakers said, we are about to throw to the breeze from yonder spire the dear old flag of our fathers and to consecrate it with our prayer. With our prayers. There is no neutral ground for us to stand upon. Those not for us are against us. Choose you this day whom you will serve. What was happening as well, those states that seceded were seizing federal property, federal installations. In the Gulf Coast area, the Union, uh, the uh, uh, Sec Treasury Secretary John Dix was giving an order to his aid as far as any attempts to seize uh, federal ships by the seceding state, Confederate states. If anyone attempts to haul down the American flag, shoot him on the spot. <laughs> Now, I don't know of any instance where someone on board a ship was trying to bring down the American flag and raise a Confederate flag. I don't know of any example. I do know of a very famous example in Alexandria, Virginia. May 24th, 1861, the day after Virginia voters ratified the state convention's decision to secede from the Union, Colonel Ellsworth and his troops entered Alexandria, Virginia. An eight by 14 foot Confederate flag large enough to be seen by spyglass from the White House, flew from Marshall House, which you see in the middle. Descending the stairs, Colonel Ellsworth was killed by a shotgun blast from James Jackson, Marshall House innkeeper. Yeah. Corporal Francis Brownell then fatally shot Jackson, which you see depicted on the right. Both became <clears throat> martyrs for their respective cause. So why is the discussion about the use of Civil War flags, why was that so important during the Civil War? Well, I call that Civil War flags and Napoleonic War tactics. Up until this point in history, muskets were basically smoothbore, which meant they were not very accurate. To really inflict damage on the enemy, you needed massed um, unit uh, tight formations. And the way to keep the, the formations really closely together would be to use the flag, rally around the flag, focus on the flag, advance or in defense, keep the units together by focusing on the flag. You see on the left-hand side, Confederate assault, Fort Sanders, Knoxville. On the right-hand side, you've got Union assault, Battle of Champion Hill, Vicksburg. Notice in the middle of battle, what's most prevalent? The flag. I attended years ago, and I, uh, I think it was an Antietam reenactment, and with all of the gunpowder smoke and the cannon fire smoke billowing across the battlefield, it was really a, a real sense of what it must have been like, because you really couldn't see at ground level very much. All of the soldiers were being obscured. What you saw very clearly were both opposing colors, A, because of the color itself, and B, because it was held on high. So you really got a sense of how those flags really kept order together very tightly in the midst of the battle. Other examples on the left, uh, Brandy Station, note the flank marker on the left-hand side. There's also Unionist, I'm um, sorry, you also have on the right-hand side, Confederate infantry flank marker with the colors of the original First National flag. There was honor and victory in capture, Bladensburg, Maryland, October 7th, 1861. William Sewell, we have a gentleman from Maine and his wife, this would be for you, William Sewell, Company A, 1st Maine Infantry. The regiment came back this morning with the secession flag that they had captured. You never heard such rousing cheers as was given them by the other regiments. While I'm writing this, the stars and stripes are flying from our Liberty Pole with the secession flag under it. There was also disgrace in loss of surrender. This is kind of a tragic tale. You had the 79th New York Infantry. Uh, brought up on charges for insubordination. The 79th heavily lost men at first battle of Bull Run. They also lost their colonel. Now, 90 day soldiers were finishing their enlistment and they went home. The 79th, even wanting to, to go on furlough to see their kith and kin in New York, they were denied that. They were denied the ability to vote for a colonel a lot of units were able to do that. That was denied. They were given a colonel they never met before. So they mutinied. They refused to fight. And you sort of can understand this was not just a lackluster group. They lost heavily at Bull Run. They've already gone through a lot. But the fact that they mutinied, there's no way that the army would allow that to continue. There's an overwhelming force arrayed against them. It's essentially stand down on the mutiny or you will be shot. So they surrendered. The leaders of that group 
were, were uh, sent to prison and their flag was basically surrendered in infamy or in ignominy um, and held there until that unit regained the respect of the army. Flags inspired, and this again is a local aspect. You've got uh, William Stowe, U.S. Army Hospital, West Philadelphia, October 10th, 1862. When the flag was unfurled to the breeze at the top of the staff, the air was filled with, the, with those little flags rolled up in the big flag. I got two of them. Uh, these are the two which you have in this letter. To inspire. Battle of Lookout Mountain, Tennessee, November 24th, 1863. Uh, look on the left-hand side, you'll see the, Union, the American flag, the Union flag. Our troops drove the enemy. We could see them come round the side. You can actually see that depicted. We could see them come round the side bearing our dear old flag, the enemy fleeing before them. William Blackmar, 15th Pennsylvania Cavalry, Chattanooga, Tennessee. By the way, when you see these letters in the middle, those are the actual letters that are reflecting on what's transpiring. And on the right-hand side is a representative Civil War era flag, just to get an idea of what kind of uh, banner or what, what, what the flag would look like as it's being brought forward, either in defense or in, in the attack. It's not just tactics that the flags had such power. There was an emotional, a deep emotional bond between the soldier and his flag. And that's on both sides of the battle. Confederates were equally as passionate about their unit or their national flag. Here we have John B. Glenn, Company C, 10th Pennsylvania Infantry. My object in coming here was to die for my country if it was necessary. And it is still my object. My position in ranks is under the folds of our flag and who would wish a more glorious place to fall than to fall under and in defense of that sacred banner? Our company is the color company of our regiment. That is, we carry the flag. Well, he survived the war. Many, many color bearers and color guides did not. To the last full measure, Battle of South Mountain, Maryland, September 14th, 1862. You see in the, the left-hand side, the battle depicted. In the right-hand side, you've got a color bearer, North Carolina statue depicting um, the losses during that battle. You've got a dying Confederate soldier flag bearer still grasping his flag. To the last full measure, Fredericksburg, Virginia. December 11th, the battle took place between 11th and the 15th, 1862. Edgar Densmore was a color bearer of the regiment and did his duty nobly. He was killed with a piece of shell that passed through the strap that was over his shoulder support, to support the color standard and into the left breast. He lived several hours after he was hit. And this is John Mason, 9th New Hampshire Infantry, writing the letter. To the last full measure, Gettysburg. Gettysburg was a horrific three-day battle, which was total warfare on the, with the opposing sides. Heavy pay, um, uh, pay for both the Union and the Confederate flag bearers. I give you an example of the 26 North Carolina flag bearers. They were involved in the assault on, on McPherson Ridge as part of the overall con uh, Confederate attack. As a North Carolina flag bearer fell, another would seize the standard and rush forward only to be shot down. Another would pick this, the banner. Knowing what he just saw, would still pick it up, move forward. He'd be shot down. For the 14th and final time on July 1st, the colors of the 26th went down. That's just not the flag going down. Those are um, 14 soldiers that are wounded or killed and their comrades see it and do the same thing only to have the same results. So that is knowing what you're about to face, but still doing it. And on the right-hand side is one of the uh, Confederate flags that were captured there. The last full measure, Gettysburg. If you're ever at Gettysburg, one of the most poignant statues you'll ever see is the Mississippi State Guards. You've got a, a dead or dying color bearer. His comrade is using his, his, mu his musket as a club. He's desperately fighting in defense of his comrade, who may be dead already, and defense of his flag. Even though the way this is depicted, you can see the desperation in his face. He's probably about to die within moments, but he's still fighting for his comrade and for the flag. To give Medal of Honor, July 12, 1862, to such non-commissioned officers and privates as shall most distinguish themselves by their gallantry in action and other soldier-like qualities during the president's erection. 
bear in mind what I've just spoken about, whether you're trying to capture an enemy flag or defend your own flags, that's equivalent to putting a bullseye on your chest or on your back. What I say before, the main thing that's visible on the battlefield is the flag. So to bring down that flag and to put disarray into the enemy's ranks, you're a major target because that is a main reason that um, they're trying to bring you down to help into to have disarray of the units. So Medal of Honors were well well earned. I'll go that for this quickly because there are a number of them. Um, Bull Run, August 30th, 1862, and Gettysburg, July 2nd, 1863. George, Rose, George Roosevelt, 26, Pennsylvania. At Bull Run, he recaptured the colors which had been seized by the enemy. At Gettysburg, he captured a Confederate color bearer in color in which effort he was severely wounded. He lost his leg amputated after that battle. Medal of Honor, Antietam, Charles Tanner, 1st Delaware Infantry, carried off the regimental colors which had fallen within 20 yards of the enemy's lines. The color guard of nine men, having all been killed or wounded, was himself three times wounded. Medal of Honor, Fredericksburg, Thomas Plunkett, 21st Massachusetts Infantry, seized the colors of his regiment, the color bearer having been shot down and bore them to the front where both his arms were carried off by shell. So it's my understanding he probably tried to cradle the flag until he was relieved by a, a color guard to be able to carry the flag further. He survived the war, but you can see on the right-hand side, he paid a heavy, heavy price. Medal of Honor, Fredericksburg, John Adams, 19th Massachusetts Infantry, seized the regimental and national colors from the hands of a corporal and a lieutenant as they fell mortally wounded, and with a color in each hand, advanced across the field to a point where the regiment was reformed. Bear it in mind again, keep the unit tightly together. The regiment was reformed on these colors. Melivana Gettysburg, Nathaniel Allen, 1st Massachusetts Infantry. When his regiment was falling back, this soldier bearing the national color, and in each instance on the left, these are depictions of the battle itself bearing the national collar, returned in the face of the enemy's fire, pulled the regimental flag from under the body of its bearer who had fallen, saved the flag from capture, and brought both colors off the field. Medal of Honor, Hugh Carey, Gettysburg, 82nd New York Infantry, captured the flag of the 7th Virginia Infantry and the 7th Virginia flags there, being twice wounded in the effort. Medal of Honor, 54th Mass, Fort Wagner, that's the, what was depicted in the movie Glory. Notice on the left-hand side, William Carney, former slave, joined the 54th Mass Infantry, first African-American Medal of Honor recipient. When the color sergeant was shot down, this soldier grasped the flag, led the way to the parapet. You can see on the left-hand side, the depiction of a soldier bringing the colors to the parapet and planted the colors thereon. When the troops fell back, he brought off the flag under a fierce fire in which he was twice severely wounded. And you've got uh, William Carney on the right-hand side of, of that slide. Medals of Honor, Nemazine Church, Virginia, April 3rd, at the very end of the Appomattox campaign towards the closing uh, period of the Civil War. Um, April 3rd, Nemazine Church, Sailors Creek, April 6th. Thomas Custer, brother of George, Armstrong Custer, 6th Michigan Cavalry, two medals of honor. He captured the flag on April 3rd, 1865. On April 6th, 1865, he leaped his horse over the enemy's works and captured two stands of colors, having his horse shot up from under him and receiving a severe wound. He was shot in the face. The guns fall silent at Appomattox. Battles would continue, men would die, but the major unit in the field, the Army of Northern Virginia, surrendered at Appomattox, April 9th, 1865. On the left-hand side, you see a towel Confederates used as a, a makeshift flag of truce. It's now in the Smithsonian. You've got the surrender ceremony in the middle, where General Lee surrenders to Grant. And on the right-hand side, it shows you've got Confederates surrendering, they're paroled, they turn in their weapons, and they turn in their beloved flag they fought for and bled for for several years. So I'm sure for the Confederates, it was an extremely emotional moment seeing their flag having to be surrendered. The power of the flag didn't end at the Civil War. People had gone through a firestorm. A lot of people had grown up in a local situation, never left from their community. 
They were thrown into a battle that took them over wide swaths of this country. So both sides, this was a life-changing event, and they, they were remembering this. On the left-hand side, you see uh, Union soldiers, Indiana veterans, Library of Congress picture. You also have next to it, Welcome 3rd Corps, 1st Division. I believe it's dated 1888. I think that was the 25th anniversary of Gettysburg. And that's a reunion banner. There's nothing on the other side. So it was meant to be hung from a reunion hall as a celebration for the veterans in, in regathering. Uh, on the Confederate side, you've got North Carolina Veterans Library of Congress, and you've got several flyers of a reunion. And in that, you can see all three stands of the, and you've got the um, national flag, first and third, and then you've got the battle flag. So both groups of veterans were remembering their experiences in reunions long after the war, and the flags were a very important part of such reunions. In memoriam, I think this person passed away in the early 20th century. In memoriam, Herman Amergarn, 5th Ohio, color bearer, Battle of Port Republic, Virginia, June 9th, 1862. And the bottom, on, you see on the on the right hand side, a little bit of the script that talks about being a color bearer and also says it's a memoriam flag. I'd like to think, and this is pure speculation on my part, notice one of the stars is overpainted in blue. I'd like to think this was a veteran, Civil War veteran version of the missing man formation, where you may have seen where there's a flight of, of uh, jets and then one of them peels off from the group and arcs skyward. It's, it's speculation, I'd like to think, because this is a memoriam flag, and this was made to look like, this is not an original flag, made to look like a Civil War flag. So I, I'm, it's my desire that that may have been a tribute to that passing of Herman Amergan. We were um, reaching the end here. I want to point out two other quick things. Okay, this is Mount Suribashi. Nothing to do with Civil War. Why the heck is it part of the presentation? Well, it again, shows the power in flags in more recent times. Mount Suribachi, Iwo Jima, February 23rd, 1945. There are six soldiers in that flag raising, and there's a monument to that flag raising in DC. But that's not the first flag. That's a larger one so that it can inspire the American forces still fighting in Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima. First one, same day, Mount Suribachi, a smaller one's raised, and there are um, eight soldiers there. And notice you've got a soldier with an M1 carbine. He's a color guard. That is not symbolic. He's a color guard because it is still an active battle zone. This is not a photo op where things are really quiet and you get press around. No. Well, why do I know that? Mount Suribachi, first flag raising on the left. You've got, of these uh, eight soldiers, two of them are killed in subsequent battle, two are wounded. Second flag raising, there are six soldiers depicted in that image on the right. Three of them were killed. So that was by no means a photo op celebratory raising the flag. It's a battle zone, and men are still going to die later that day. So wrapping up, I'm hoping that through this presentation, it shows the sacrifice that's been made by men and now women in defense of the flag, civil war, to the present, and hopefully that gives a much deeper meaning to capture the flag that is much more, much more meaningful and deeper than a child's game. Thank you. Yeah, in terms of the, the question was, in terms of how many men can, or part of the color guard, I'm not really sure of the makeup, and my guess being the din of battle, I, I mentioned that there were instances in which eight color, uh, eight color guard were shot down. So even if there was a designated number, in the heat and chaos of battle, I'm sure there became a, a spontaneous reaction to people nearest those, may have been all the color guard are down, others would jump in to try to protect. As a color bearer, you have no way to protect yourself. And so if you're relying on the color guard, so I don't know the number, but my guess is in the din of battle, even when they fall, others would come in to take their place to protect. And the other one was in terms of unit and uh, national. I think in terms, again, of the din of battle, you're not focusing as much on the national flag as you are your own regiment, because again, that's trying to keep that localized group tightly together. So my guess, and I haven't really researched it, but of the two, probably more on the unit level because you're trying to keep that unit tightly together. The other is more probably a national representation of the force at large. <music>